This talk is near and dear to my heart because whenever I did work at North Point, I worked in the care ministry, and one of the ministries I worked in was Renew. And so basically, if you've ever wondered, well, I wonder what that Renew ministry is all about, this is sort of it tonight. So you're going to get a crash course on this tonight. We all believe lies, everybody. You know, whether you're a female, whether you're a male, whether you're a child, it doesn't matter. You know that with your children. They come in, they say, nobody likes me. That's a lie. People do like them right? But um, we all believe lies, and we have to start learning how to tear those lies down and and then replace them with truth. And you know what? I just looked at the preview screen. I didn't even show y'all my family. Let me show you my family. I'm so sorry. (laughs) This is my family. I have four children and uh, two son-in-laws and a third that's getting ready to join and five grandchildren. How about that? That's crazy. And I tell myself, you're not old enough to be a grandmother, but I am. (laughs) So that's my family. My son just got engaged too. So next year we'll have the whole crew there, which is crazy. All right, now let's jump back into the lies. I just saw that picture. I'm like, wow, that's a pretty family back there. (laughs) Oh, it's yours. Okay. Um, Anyways, we all believe lies. But a lot of times we don't even recognize or realize that they are lies. And so that's the first step in tearing those lies down is recognizing that is not what God says about me. That is not what God says in the Bible about me. That's not my identity. That's what I believe, but that's not true. A lot of these lies are formed when we're very young, and we also pick many up as we get older, but a lot of them are formed whenever we're young and we don't even realize it. Let me give you an example. So I am actually from the Atlanta area. I was born in East Point, and then I moved to Sandy Springs, and then my family moved up to Forsyth County. My dad was just a visionary. He didn't even know it, that that was going to be the place that was going to blow up. But anyways, um, I came from a family of four girls, and I was third in the roundup of the four girls, and I had a very loving father and mother, but my dad especially was very protective of his girls, and he referenced us like that all the time. You're my girls. Okay, Dad, we got it. You have four girls. You love us. It's awesome. But he was very protective of us. He never wanted us to really and truly work outside the home because he didn't want anything to influence us in a bad way. He... Um, We moved out to Forsyth County. He bought horses, and and we could look at the horses, but we could never ride the horses. When he wasn't home, or we did get uh, lessons once a week, a horse person would come out to our place and give us lessons. So we could only ride if the instructor was there or if my father was there, which wasn't very much. I got to take care of the stinky horses, but I couldn't really ride them because he said, you might fall off the horse, you might hurt yourself, you might break a bone, and I, could, I would never forgive myself if something happened to one of my girls. We had a boat up at Lake Lanier. We had skis inside the boat. We never skied. I asked Dad one one Saturday, we were out on Lake Lanier, Dad, can we get the skis out and try it? And he goes, no. And I'm like, why? And he goes, well, you might fall and break something, and then I would never forgive myself. What if the rope got caught up in the engine, and and then you would get cut or or worse, die? And I'm like, oh, my, well, there's a lot of people skiing around here. (laughs) They're not dying. When I was in high school, I had this crush on this boy in, in high school, and he did this Bible study in his class. So of course, I showed up. I'm here. And um, I was so excited. He lived in Roswell. I'm living in Cumming. My dad got home, and he t- asked my mom, where's Karen? And she said, well, she went to the Bible study. I mean, it's good that our teenage daughter is at a Bible study on Wednesday night. And he called up the house where I was, come home. And I'm like, come home. I just got here, and I'm sitting next to him. (laughs) And he says, come home. It's foggy outside. You might get in a car accident and die, and I'll never forgive myself. I'm like, for the love. (laughs) But that, that influence in my life was my entire childhood until I married my husband. And I married a fighter pilot in the Navy who was not afraid of anything. And I can, honestly, that's when I started realizing, you're not afraid of anything. I'm afraid of my shadow. I, I'm sorry, this thing keeps popping. Can I do something to make it not? No? Okay. Anyways, so uh, I just 
I, I started realizing that I was so fearful all the time. And then whenever I had children, that just multiplied by 100. And then we had this little lake behind our house, and I'd call my parents and mom say, are you watching the kids? And I'm like, well, of course, mom. I'm a stay-at-home mom. I'm watching the kids. And she goes, well, don't let them go out and drown in that lake. <laughs> oh, my stars. Like, and I, then I start thinking, am I going to let my kids drown in the lake? Like, that's terrible. Like, don't go outside. Don't even go near the lake. Mm. It was terrible. Well, I joined this little Bible study. I'm going to get to the point of my story here soon, I promise. I joined this little Bible study. It was Christmas time, and they had a, an event at the leader's home. And, you know, I'm all social, so I went, of course. And we had dinner, and then we had this little craft time. And I'm not real crafty. And so they said, go pick out a verse, pick one that's special to you, and then go into the kitchen area, and, and we're going to make these little things that you can hang in your, your home or whatever, wherever you want to put them. I didn't even look at my verse. I just was talking, talking, talking. I picked up the verse, and I'm, I go to the kitchen, and I'm talking to everybody, and I'm making my verse. It's so pretty. I go home. I'm a young mom. Got three children. Where's a young mom all the time? She's at her sink. So I just hung it on my cabinet next to my sink. Didn't even think a thing about it. Later on, I looked at it. It's actually 2 Timothy 1.7, and it says, For God does not give us a spirit of fear but of power, love, and self-control. I didn't really connect that to me being fearful all the time. I did just, that didn't connect. But my husband was in the Navy. I told you all that. He was a fighter pilot in the Navy, and he traveled a lot. And at this point in my life, he was actually traveling in um, the Navy a lot, and then he was also a FedEx pilot, and they're gone two weeks out of the month. So he was averaging four to five days a month home. So whenever he would travel, I would get very fearful at night. One night, I'm laying in bed, and I think I hear somebody in the house. And I'm like, oh, they're here. I know they're here. <laughs> they came in whenever I was unloading the groceries. The kids were running in and out. A band could have walked through my house, and I would have not noticed it. They've been hiding in that downstairs closet underneath the stairs, and now they're coming to kill me and my children. And, of course, Greg isn't here, so he's going to hear about it on the news. It's going to be horrible. And I am laying there, and I am frozen. Has anybody ever just been frozen in fear before? I'm laying there, and I'm like, it's go time. They're coming in. They're going to kill me. It's going to be horrible. Maybe they'll, who are they going to kill first, me or my children? Just kill me first. I just can't take it. I cannot watch my children die. I mean, I'm just, I'm frozen. And so I start praying, God, help me do something. And all of a sudden, that verse came back to my mind. I, that verse had been sitting there for months. But you know what? I had been reading it for months, whether I realized it or not. And all of a sudden, for God does not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. And then I, I thought to myself, okay, well, if this, I am definitely fearful right now. So if this isn't from God, where is this coming from? And then, all of a sudden, my mind goes straight back to my childhood, sitting at First Baptist Church of Atlanta with Dr. Stanley in the balcony. I'm in the balcony listening to him, and he said, in this world, there are only two realms. There is God, and there is Satan, and that is it. There's nothing in between. And I remember that. I have not thought about that sermon. I was in the fourth grade when I heard that sermon. So then I start thinking, okay, I am definitely fearful right now. Like, I can't even move. I'm so scared. He's coming. This man is coming up my stairs. He's been hanging out in my closet all day. He's coming to get me. And I said, well, if, it's, if fear doesn't come from God, where is it coming from? Dr. Stanley says it's not of God. It's of Satan. So then it just made me mad, you know? I'm like, oh, you're just a jerk. You're trying to keep me awake all night, so I'm going to be a bear in the morning for those children. It doesn't take me much to go to the bear whenever their dad's traveling. You know what I mean? And I just got so angry, and I said, Satan, out loud, I said this, Satan, you're not welcome here. In the name of Jesus, I command you to leave. And for the first time in my life, I wasn't afraid, and I rolled over and I went to sleep. That was just a, the very first taste I've ever had 
of that power, you know, of Jesus and his name and what it means. Because lies bind us up. It's like we're a bunch of mummies walking around because we're so bound we can't even move. Because we're believing all these lies that are not true, that are not in the Bible. They're not scriptural at all. That, that was the lie I was believing, that I must be in control to be safe and secure. Because that's what my dad inadvertently taught me my whole life. You have to be in control of your situation in order to stay safe. It's on you to be safe. It's on me to keep you safe. Otherwise, something might happen and you might die. If I heard that once, I heard it 150 times throughout my life. There's a lot of other lies that we believe. Let me just run through a few with you right here. Um, I must please others to be loved or accepted. Does anybody recognize that one? I must be guarded and not risk intimacy to be safe. If you've ever been hurt in a relationship, if you ever had a parent that walked out on you, this might be a lie that you struggle with every single day. I, I must be guarded and not risk intimacy to be safe. Life must be fair. How many of us believe that lie? I believe that lie so many times. We won't even have time to get into that one tonight. I must be heard to know I'm a value. I said I was number three in a lineup of four sisters. I was never heard in my house. We'd be at the dinner table. Everybody would be talking. I'd say, up, up, up. Everybody would keep talking. I'd get louder and louder. And they're like, Karen, why are you yelling? And I'm like, I'm yelling because nobody's listening to me. And I want to tell you about my day. Another lie is I must be the best to know I'm of value. Another one is I'm inadequate and a failure. Another one is love is earned. Another one is I must perform, achieve to be accepted. If you live in the Atlanta area, I'm pretty sure you, you believe this lie at some point in your life because this city is a, a city of achievers. And if, you, and if you believe that, I must achieve in order to be loved and accepted, and you don't know what God's word says about you, then you're going to believe that lie. And you're going to be like a mummy all wrapped up in bondage because lies bring bondage. But you're thinking, well, how do we get out of this cycle? How do we get out of the cycle? Well, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 10.5, he says, take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Then Paul tells us again in Romans 12.2, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. The pattern of this world we have to break if we want to find freedom, okay? Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, that's what I did back in Virginia, and I didn't even know I was doing it. I took a thought captive. God is not giving me the spirit of fear. and So I took that thought captive, and then I replaced it with truth. In the name of Jesus, Satan, I have power over you, and I command you to leave. You are not welcome here. And he has to go. Because if I have Jesus inside of me, Jesus rules over Satan. Thank you. That's amazing. We could stop right there, but we're going to keep going. <laughs> because there's a whole lot more to unpack. Here's the deal. God's truth is the key in all of this. In John 8, 32, Jesus says, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Instead of walking around in bondage all the time and believing all these lies, we could all be free in this room. Isn't that amazing? The Bible tells us to walk in the truth, to love the truth, and to believe the truth. But a lot of us don't even really know what the truth is. Because we don't even dig down deep into the, it's all throughout your Bible. But we have, to, we have to dig into it. But the best part of all of this is Jesus is the truth. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's a, that's a key ingredient. And I did give y'all that handout, and whenever you go home, I've listed some of these lies. Well, actually, clarification, I didn't list these lies. Renew of North Point Ministry listed these lies, and I asked them permission if I could use it, and they said, of course. Anytime we can spread this out, let's just do it. It's the Word of God, so yes, do it. 
So y'all start studying it, and I'm going to teach you how to do that once we get to the end. But here's the deal. In order for you to start knowing what is truth and what's a lie, you have to know what the truth is. Okay? If you work in a retail shop and there's a lot of counterfeit money going around, they will teach you as the salesperson what a real $100 bill looks like or a real $20 bill looks like. They do not show you what counterfeit looks like. They show you what the real deal looks like. So then people will know. If you start getting into the Bible and start reading it, then you will start knowing what God's truth is. And then you'll be able, you're like this, just like me. I felt like, I mean, I was fearful. I couldn't move. It wasn't making it up. I wasn't being dramatic. I really and truly felt someone was in my home. But I wasn't in any danger. And then I realized, oh, this is, this is the enemy messing with me. And you're thinking, why, why would he do that? Well, he, the Bible tells us that he walks around like a roaring lion looking for those he can destroy. And if you are a child of God, he wants to destroy you. And listen, don't trust me. Don't trust your gut. Don't trust your common sense. Get in the word of God. Learn it. Apply it. Read it. Because Jesus also says something about Satan. He says in John 8:44. When he lies, Satan, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Isn't that crazy? Like when he speaks, he, everything he says is a lie. And to show you that example, I want to take us all the way back to the beginning of the Garden of Eden, because this is where it starts. And yes, I'm old and now I wear readers. This happened during COVID. It was terrible. All right. Genesis 3, 1 through 5. I'm going to hang in there with me. I'm going to read all of this. Now the serpent, which is Satan, was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God has made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Look how he phrases that to her. Did God really say that? Doesn't he do that to us? Is it really true that the borrower will be servant to the lender? Is that true? I don't think so. Everybody else has that. They all put it on their credit card, and they seem like they're doing pretty good. Maybe that's just a lie he's told me over and over. But I'm telling you, it's a lie. Did he really say that, Satan says? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. This is important right here. Eve knows what God said. She's not on shaky ground here. She knows beyond a shadow of a doubt, yes, he did say this. He did. He quotes, she quotes God exactly. But then Satan comes back. And that's what Satan does. He's not just going to tempt you once, throw a lie out there to you. He's going to come back and come back and come back. And that's what he did to Jesus whenever he was in the desert for those 40 days and 40 nights. He kept coming back to him. But how did Jesus combat him? Scripture. That's what he, he did. Now look in verse 4. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Here's the deal. And this is why Satan is so crafty. That's a half-truth and a half lie. Their eyes were going to be opened. They were going to be able to detect what good and evil are. But they're not going to be godlike. That's where he got her. And so she ate it. When my son became, when he was about six years old, and I took him to that um, thing on Upstreet where they learn about, you know, everything, and he was putting it all together, and he said, wow. Eve really messed up. And I said, she did. <laughs> he said, she, she really messed up for all of us. And I said, yes, yeah, she did. But that's what we need to know is that Satan is a liar. And you might be thinking, well, I'm really depressed. You know, now you're telling me all this stuff. Like, how do I fight this? We have power over Satan as Christians. And that's encouraging. And that is is amazing because we can conquer him. And that's how we conquer him is we take every thought captive 
and then we renew our minds with truth. You cannot think two thoughts at the same time. You can't believe the lie and believe the truth at the same time. So you have to say, that is not true. And I'm not going to believe that because this is what Scripture says is true about me. And this is what Scripture says about this. And that's how you start renewing your mind. Let's just look at another lie, the one that I said, I must please others to be loved or accepted. The truth is, my need for acceptance is met in Christ. Others were not meant to meet all of my needs. I have told myself this truth over and over and over and over and over again in my life, whenever my friends weren't meeting my needs, when my husband wasn't meeting my needs. Or, you know, how it is, you'll bend over backwards over the holidays and do every single thing uh, that your mother wants you to do, and you're doing all this, and you're just so tired, even though you really don't want to do it. I must please others in order to be loved and accepted. I must do this, or I'm going to make my mom mad or frustrated. She may get mad or frustrated, but the truth is my need for acceptance is met in Christ. If I'm doing all I can do and I can't do any more, and I tell my mom, Mom, I can't do any more, this is all I got, and she doesn't like that, that's really her issue, it's not mine. Because I'm doing all I can do. And my needs are met in Christ. And I'm accepted in Him. Before I learned these truths, I wasn't free. I was just bound up all the time. And also, hear me say this, it's a process. It's not a one and done kind of thing. That, that fear was from me, in me, from my childhood, and I was in my 30s before I broke that. But wow, did it feel so good. It felt so good whenever my children, you know, as adults, you know, when everything went down last year with COVID and all that, my daughter came in from Texas and she was listening to the radio and the news all the time, all the time, and this report and this report and just going crazy all the time. And she's like, why aren't you worked up about this? And I'm like, I mean, I don't like it. And she goes, yeah, but you're not fearful. And I said, what can I really do about it? I am washing my hands till my skin is about to fall off. I'm wearing that silly mask everywhere. I'm doing my thing. I'm doing my thing. I'm doing it. I'm staying indoors. I'm not going out. I'm not, I'm, I miss going into a restaurant, and I can't go into any restaurants. This was like March, April. And I said, but you know what, Kelsey? I'm not going to live in fear. I've done that before, and it's not good. And you know what? I don't want to get COVID. I don't want any of y'all to get COVID. I don't want anybody to get COVID. But if I get COVID, that just means I go on to heaven and I'm with Jesus, you know, and if I get it and I die, then I'm, I'm with Jesus sooner. And she was like, you're crazy. And I said, I mean, I feel good. I'm going to sleep real good at night. <laughs> it's a process. Let me give you another example. I got a little bit more time. Let me give you one more example. This is real life right here. This is transparent stuff. So don't judge me, okay? Please don't judge me. When we moved back to Virginia, I wanted to move back to Georgia for 13 years. I just couldn't wait. And Greg says, we are not going to get in over our heads, Karen, whenever we buy a house. And I'm like, okay, yeah, of course not. Anything, just a little shack on the side of the road is fine with me. <laughs> I didn't care. I just wanted to go home. So we bought this little, we, it was a normal size house. But there was nothing extra about this house. And if I had a picture, I'd show it to you, but I don't. But there was nothing extra. And when we moved in, my stuff from Virginia did not fit in this house. And I told Greg, as the movers were moving in, I mean, this house is good, and it, it'll be good for about five years, and then we're going to move, right? And he said, no, we're not going to move. And I said, oh, okay, I'll work on you. <laughs> so I worked on him for five years. Can we move? Can we move? He says, we're not moving. And on year six, he looks at me and he goes, Karen, we are not moving. And that the bad thing about it is, is I worked at North Point at the time, and I didn't make hardly any money. I mean, I think I started off at $10 an hour. <laughs> so I could not go to the bank and get a loan for a house. You know what I mean? I sort of needed him to be on my side for this. But for the next six years, 
For, so we were there total 12. We did not move. And I had to find contentment in that house. And that was hard because I did not like that house. That house was too small for us. Y'all saw all the kids we have. And they were getting big. They were getting to be teenagers. But God was like, girl, we're going to work out several lies before you leave out of this house. And the first one is your lie of, I can't be happy in these circumstances. You can get happy. And I'm going to leave you here until you get happy. Another one, a lie that I was believing is life is not fair. It wasn't fair to me that everybody had nicer homes than me. My best friend built three new homes in those 12 years. And I would go to her to look at, pick out the nice granite for her six-foot island in her kitchen. She put that in three homes. I would go with her to pick out her stone for her, you know, fireplace outside. Hmm. I would go with her to do all these things. And I would just have to celebrate in my heart. I'm happy for you. I'm happy for you. And I will tell you this. I did find contentment in that house. I really did. I learned to be thankful for every little thing. And some mornings, the only thing I could be thankful for were the birds singing outside of my window. And that's what I would say. All right, God, I'm thankful for the birds that are singing outside my window right now. And I tell you all that, that it's a process, because I want you to know, don't give up. Keep doing it. God is faithful. His word is true. It will not return void. I promise you. You have a choice. You can either live in bondage, walk around like a mummy, or you can be free. It's your choice. And if you want freedom, the path is Jesus. Let me close this in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you are our freedom. And thank you that Satan does not have power over us, God. Thank you that um, you've given us your word that we can open on a daily basis and read it. God, I just pray that these ladies will take these sheets that they're holding in their laps. And they will write out these verses and put them all over their house to renew their mind. And take those thoughts, those lies captive, God. Take their thoughts captive and renew their mind with truth. God, I just pray that all of us will just be encouraged by tonight in your word and that we will start walking out for freedom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.